Good afternoon. Maybe some people read ahead of time the portion of Revelation and thought, oh, this doesn't look like a nice letter. Better stay at home today. But, but as, uh, as Pastor Roger mentioned, as I was preparing this, um, this message, reading through this letter is probably, this letter is probably one of the more difficult or harder or more stricter, more rebuking in nature letters that Jesus writes in, out of these seven churches. And actually, this is the longest letter out of the seven um, letters that are written. It's the longest one. But sadly, it's the least known or the least important or the least remarkable of the seven cities. So we don't know a lot archaeologically. We don't know a lot historically about this city. There's not too much that's known. I have a couple of pictures here just to show a little bit of what um, some of the old city of Tyrtira looks like. Um, again, not very much is known about this city historically. One of the things that was known about this city is that it was a city known of guilds. Now, in the olden days, they had these guilds which were um, basically, if you were, uh, for example, a carpenter, then you would belong to the guild of the carpenters. If you were, um, I don't know, uh, a farmer, you would belong to the guild of the farmers. But the problem was that in, that, in, the, in the city of Tyrtira, there was, of course, a lot of pagan worship, as was in the other cities of those days. And the problem was that if you were part of a guild, and then you decided to um, um, then you decided to become a Christian, now there was a problem. Because in these guilds, it was sort of like the, maybe I could say the social security of today or the CPP of today, right? Or the uh, EI of today, where you would contribute into your guild. And as you would contribute into that, then if something happened, if you got sick, your family got sick, then the guild would take care of you, right? And so it was sort of like a support system or a support structure of, of that day, especially in the city of Tyrtira, they were known for their guilds. But the problem was that if you converted to Christianity, if you became a Christian, now you were putting your money into this guild, but there was a lot of immorality that was going on. There was a lot of ungodliness that was taking place. And so as a Christian, you now had to make a decision, should I contribute into this guild, because now my money is going to be used for pagan worship. Now my money is going to be used for this thing and that thing and so many other things that you might not stand for as a Christian. So now you had to make a decision. I can't contribute into, into this anymore. And if I can't do that, then what happens if I fall sick? Who's going to take care of my family if something happens in the future? And then so there's so many other implications, practical implications that take place if someone decides to become a Christian. Then you become rejected from that society. Now, all of your friends who was part of that guild, and because, for example, if you were a farmer, then your son would be a farmer. And more than likely, your uncle was a farmer, and your uncle's, you know, brother was a farmer as well, too. And it would, you know, it would go along in family lines. And now if you were not going to take part in that guild, then that would also have repercussions with your family as well. And so there are so many things that took place in that time because of someone converting to Christianity. And in writing this letter, we read the letter already, but in writing this letter, the Lord is actually rebuking them because of a lot of different things that's going on in the church and them not making a difference between the holy and the unholy, between the clean and and the unclean, between what is righteous and good and what is unrighteous. And their decisions, and, and the decision to follow Christ had great implications, as it is today. Maybe not so in the world, in this Western world that we live, maybe we've compromised, maybe we've gotten away with so many things that is not pleasing to the Lord. But in other parts of the world, the decision to become a Christian is sometimes life or death. The decision to become a Christian is, the, is f facing rejection from your family. The decision to become a Christian and to serve the Lord has so many other implications maybe that we don't realize. 
But in the day of when Jesus was writing this letter to the church in in Tyre, when John was writing this letter on, on behalf of Jesus, the message he received, there was a lot of things that were going on. This is sort of what the, the city of Tyre looks right now. That's the modern day, day city. But there was a lot of difficulties at that during that day. So before we just go into the letter, let's say a word of prayer. Father, I thank you and I praise you, Lord God, for your word, which is pure. I thank you for your word, which is true. I thank you for your word, which is a two-edged sword that, Lord, convicts and tries and purifies. Lord, even as I speak, let it do that for me as well. Lord, I just pray that you would give us open hearts to receive your word. And more than anything, Lord, help us to apply your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I wish this letter was all about love or hope or nice things like that, but it isn't as we read. So, as I mentioned from the beginning, some of these things might be a little difficult, a little hard, and if it comes and convicts us, then that's a good thing. Amen? That's a good thing because it helps us to understand uh, where we are in our spiritual lives with the Lord. In Acts chapter 16, actually, we read about a, a lady. Her name was Lydia, and she was actually from the guild of the, maybe the seamstresses, right? Because she was known as a dealer in purple cloth, and uh, she actually was converted to Christianity through the ministry of Paul, and probably through her, maybe this church entire terror started. We don't know for sure, but there's a possibility that maybe through her, uh, this church started. And she was in this, more than likely, in this guild of the seamstresses or, you know, dealers in textiles and things like that, okay? But we don't know too much about her. But starting off in, the, in, this, in this letter in, from verse 18, Jesus, first is the revelation of Jesus uh, to this church. And the revelation that he gives is that he is the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. So these eyes like a flame of fire can speak to us about how he sees everything and nothing is hidden from his sight, right? Now, that could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, right? For children, you know, sometimes if they're doing something, they want to hide something from their parents, they're hoping their parents are not watching, but how many know that the Lord sees all things? 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. So we might be able to hide something right now, but how many know there will be a day coming when everything will be manifest, Right? What if I were to tell you, Will, guess what? Next slide here has what you did yesterday. The next slide here has what you thought yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Probably don't want me to press the next button, right? What if that was you up there? That the next slide had what you're thinking, right? Maybe you're thinking, right, man, I could use some KFC about now, right? I'm hungry. But how many know that we're happy that our thoughts are not publicly known? Right? Aren't we? If our thoughts were publicly known, oh, what a shame it would be. But how many know that, that God, Jesus, whose eyes are like a flame of fire, he can see even our, our thoughts. And nothing is hidden from him. His feet were like fine brass. It speaks about his, the firmness in his judgment that he's not going to be moved. He's immovable. You know, if there's a righteous judge, then he will judge righteously and correctly. It doesn't matter what you try to, you know, say to persuade him. He will judge righteously. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. So there, there's coming a day when judgment will come. And the Bible says that judgment actually starts in the house of God, amongst us, the people of God. And he says, if judgment starts with us, the people of God, then where will the unrighteous land? And so we should really take heed to this. So, so Jesus, you know, he, he doesn't really start off with something that's very nice in the revelation of himself. He starts off saying, hey, my eyes are like flames of fire. I see every little thing that you're doing. And my feet are like fine brass. I'm not going to be moved. 
And then from verse 20 to 23, he goes into this, this reproof and correction. And the biggest thing that he talks about here is that he makes reference to a lady by the name of Jezebel. And this reference to Jezebel probably dates back to the Old Testament time during the days of Ahab, and Ahab's wife was Jezebel. And the Bible says that Jezebel was a wicked woman. She was a terrible woman. And she turned away Ahab's heart from the Lord. And she did so many wicked things in Israel. It was a, a leader in idolatrous worship. She turned Israel away from the living and true God. She was against Elijah and everything that he was trying to do as well in leading the people into righteous worship and leading the people back into the presence of God. More than likely, this Jezebel that's referred to here in this letter was probably a lady in the church that exemplified various characteristics of this Old Testament woman, Jezebel. And she was probably a person in the church that was leading the people away from the truth of holiness and purity and towards sexual immorality. And more than likely, this woman was, was somebody that uh, symbolized all that Jezebel symbolized in terms of sexual immorality, worshiping idols, worshiping other gods, uh, going away from the things of the Lord. Jezebel can speak about the, the spirit of the world, the things that the world has to offer to us that is contrary to the things of God. The philosophies of the world, the standards of the world, the mentality of the world, which many times are opposite to the way that God works. How many know that in so many different ways, God's ways are contrary to the ways of the world? You know, we just came out of Easter, and in studying about the cross, we, we talked about a little bit uh, some weeks ago about the beauty of the cross or the paradox of the cross, totally opposite to the ways of the world, that we die in order to, to live, where the world says, no, 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 you fight for your rights. Where the cross says you yield in order to gain, the world says, no, 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 no you got to go and gain. you got to accumulate all that you can accumulate. Where the cross says, you die to your will in order to fulfill the will of God, the world says, no, 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 you let your will be the important thing. Who cares about what other people want? Do what feels right for you. And so the mentality of the cross, the mentality of the kingdom of God, is totally different from that of the world. And so in this letter to this church in Thyatira, they, it, there was the, the Lord was really rebuking them because they had shifted from the truth, from the purity and uprightness and, and the sincerity of the word of God. And they, they're following after the ways of Jezebel and going away from what God wanted for them. In so many ways, uh, similar to the way that Jezebel led the children of Israel away from God. And sad to say, some of the people, their, their eyes were blinded because of Jezebel. Jezebel was, the, the ways of Jezebel was so attractive to the people. They said, oh, let's, let's follow that way. Oh, that looks so good. That looks so enticing. That looks so, so, with so much pleasure, with so much uh, good things. And, and they wanted to go after those things. And, and, and they were weighing, oh, the things of God, it looks so boring, and oh, and this and that, and oh, but the ways of the world, it looks so enticing, so nice, and there's so much pleasure that's there. And so it's so easy to, to get pushed over to this side instead of staying with the truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is speaking about the unbelievers, but sad to say many times it happens even to us, where it says, and even if our gospel is veiled or hidden, it is veiled or hidden to those who are perishing. And here it says what the God of this world does, it says the Age, or the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But sad to say, though, sometimes for us, after maybe many years of walking with the Lord or after some time of fellowshipping with God, maybe some of these things, because of the trials of life or difficulties of life, or maybe because of the temptations of the world or the pleasures of the world, what happens, our eyes start to become veiled or hidden. And we don't see the light of the glory of God. Instead, we see the light of this world and we say, oh, I want a little bit of that. I want to enjoy some of those things. And the world becomes such an attraction. And it's the way of Jezebel. The ways of God are in such stark contrast with the ways of the world. It's interesting to see 
nowadays the philosophy in the world is some of the principles are actually rooted in Christian principles. For example, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Christian principle, correct? Found in the word of God. But now the world has taken that to an extreme to say that let's be kind to everybody and nice to everybody, which is good, but even to the point of excusing sin and calling sin Say, oh, let's not call sin that. Don't be so mean to them. Don't say that's a sin. Just be accepting of that. And it's gone to another extreme. Years ago, actually, hundreds of years ago, actually, in the, uh, in the early, say, 300s or so, there were Christian theologians that actually fought for some of these rights, like the abolition of slavery and um, uh, rights for women and family values and things like that. There were actually theologians in the early uh, days of the church that wrote, for, wrote about these things because they found that it was rooted in godly Christian values. But sad to say now some of these things have gone to another extreme where you can't even say anything against those things because you can't call sin, sin. And the world has distorted some of these things. Are you all on the same page with me? And, it's, and it's, very, it, it's very interesting to see how the world has, 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 has taken some of these things and they don't even realize that some of these principles are rooted in Christian doctrine and principles. But the sad thing is that it's gone to an extreme where you can't even call sin, sin. And that's where there has to be a dividing line in the church where the church is a light in the midst of darkness, where the word of God shines forth clearly and says that this is right and this is wrong. And sad to say in the church in Tyatira, they had gone in the wrong way and they weren't able to call sin, sin. They had gone in the way of Jezebel and they'd given room for her to work within the church and taken people away from holiness and purity, taken people away from the right ways of God and they'd gone in sexual immorality and they'd gone in idolatry and they've gone through into, into pagan worship. You know, William Wilberforce, he was a, he was a man in, in England and that he, he was a champion of the abolition of the slave trade, but he was a Christian. His desires to see the abolition of the slave trade was rooted in the fact that he was a Christian man saved by the grace of God. And because of his conviction as a Christian and because of his Christian principles, he fought for what was right. And he fought for the abolition of the slave trade. But it was founded on Christian principles. And in our lives as well, God is calling us to stand up for what is right, for what is true, for what is pure, for what is holy, what is important, according to the word of God. God has called us to be sanctified, to live a holy life for the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 13 and 14, it says, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this uh, through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us to the sanctifying work of the Spirit and to belief in in the truth of the word of God. Ahab thought it was a, a light thing, a small thing, an insignificant thing to take Jezebel for his wife and to yield to the things that she was asking for. Sad to say many times in our lives as well, we compromise in various situations and take it very lightly. Some of the things that the world is offering to us and we compromise our convictions and we compromise our faith and think it's such a light thing or think it's like a small thing. And the spirit of Jezebel is causing many to compromise their Christian convictions. This can happen spiritually. It can happen even literally. Here it speaks about, in this letter, it speaks about sexual immorality. And in a spiritual way, we can commit sexual immorality. We could, we could go against 
that holiness and purity that God is calling us to have in our lives, in a literal sense as well, we can commit that, and that's against God's word too. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, I warned you ahead of time, right? So I'm just telling you what the letter says, okay? But in James chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, you adulterous people. These are strong words. This, you know, this is not James writing an evangelistic letter to people so that they could repent and be saved. This is James writing a letter to the churches. He wrote this letter to various churches abroad. If you read the beginning, his introduction, he's, he's talking about to the churches abroad. And he says here, you adulterous people. These are strong words that he says here. What if Pastor Roger, what if your pastor were, were to come up and say, you adulterous people, what would you do? It's a strong word. But what does he say here? He says, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God or being an enemy of God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world automatically, what happens? Becomes an enemy of God. What is the world? It's the systems of the world, the, the mentality of the world, the, the way the world thinks. Again, as I mentioned, that's contrary to the kingdom of God. The values of the world versus the values of the kingdom of God. The ways of the world versus the way of the, the kingdom of God. The way of the kingdom of God is humble yourself and Christ will exalt you. The way of the world is you exalt yourself, you know, push yourself to the front, fight for your rights, and then everyone will honor you. But that's opposite to the way the kingdom of God works. Right? And it's so easy, little by little, we can become desensitized with the things of this world. How many know that? It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen little by little. little I'm, I'm sure you've heard the, the analogy of a, a frog in a boiling pot of water. If you boil a pot of water and dump a frog in, what happens? The frog will jump right out. But if you put a frog in some water and start to boil it, the water will heat up, heat up, heat up until the frog is dead. And that can happen to us. That we can become desensitized because we're surrounded by the things of the world. We're living in this world. Jesus told his disciples, you have to live in this world but not be of this world. And it's so easy because we're living in this world that we can become desensitized with the things of this world contrary to the ways of God. If it was, if it was something terrible, 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 it would be like the frog jumping in the boiling hot pot of water and jumping right out, right? If it's something terrible, you go, oh, no, 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 I won't do that. Ooh, stay away from that. Don't do that. But what happens? It's something small that we compromise on. And then it's another small thing. And then it's another small thing. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. And then another small thing. And then another small thing. And then lo and behold, we're over here when we should be over there. And this is what he was talking about to the church there in Thyatira. It's interesting, you know, when the, when the federal income tax law in the United States was signed in 1913, one of the senators who was opposing that federal, you know, it's tax season now, okay? You know, you've got a few more days, I think, right? So when they signed that income tax law, you know what one senator said? One senator said, if we allow this 1% foot in the door, at some future date, it might rise to 5%. That's what he said at that time. Now it's risen to, I don't know how much percent there and, and over here in Canada as well. But it started with a little bit, and then it increased, increased, and increased. But that can happen to us, dear people of God, friends. It's so easy for us. If we're not diligent with our lives, if we're not diligent in prayer and in reading of the Word of God and investing into our lives with the Word of God, with the Spirit of the Lord, with, with the presence of God, uh, diligent to come out to the house of God, to hear the Word of God, to, to worship the Lord, if we're not diligent to invest in our lives, then what happens? Then little by little, we can become desensitized to the things of God and more sensitized to the things of this world. 
The spirit of Jezebel was causing them to eat things sacrificed to idols. And probably literally at that time, if you were eating something like that, maybe it was something that would offend their consciences. And it was like, oh, you're part of that group now. You're part of the idol worshipers now. Right? And it was a sad thing. The spirit of Jezebel, it says here, was, was trying to uh, seduce the people away from the way of holiness. And in this letter, it says God gave them time to repent. But what happened? They didn't repent. Right? See, he says he gave them time to repent. It says I, he gave them time for repentance, but she did not repent. How many know that repentance is a gift that God gives to us? It's not like something we can say, if God is asking us to repent today, it's not like we can say, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. Oh, I'll do that next week. Some people say, oh, you know, just before I die, I will repent. I want to live my life. I want to enjoy myself here. And just before I die, I'm going to repent and ask God to forgive me for all my sins. More than likely, that's not going to work out. I don't know if I told you the story of a young man. I might have. Please forgive me if I have. But there was a young man, and he got into a car accident. And... Um, Initially, I, went, I, I called him, and I was talking to him on the phone, and I said, can I come over and see you? And he's like, oh, no, don't come. I'm all drugged up right now. He had so many painkillers and, and things like that. God spared his life. But eventually, by the end of the conversation, he said, okay, just come over. It's okay. So I went over to see him, and I was, tell, and I was trying to share the word of God with him. He, he grew up in church, but he had left the house of God, and he was mixed up with a lot of different things. And I shared with him and I told him, I said, please, you know, come back to the Lord. And I shared the gospel with him and I shared the love of God with him. Finally, by the end, he just told me, he listened and everything and he was very respectful. And he just told me, he said, I'm just not ready. I can't. A few weeks later, he got into another car accident with a tractor trailer, died on the spot. Didn't even get a chance. God gave him an opportunity there and I shared with him, I poured out my heart to him, and I pleaded with him. But he didn't take that opportunity. And a few weeks later, not even a chance, because he, they said he died instantly. And here in this, in this letter, they were given a chance, but they didn't. In Hebrews chapter 12, because of time we won't read all the verses, but verses 16 and 17 talks about Esau and how he, he sold his birthright for a little bit of food. He just wanted some, 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 some satisfaction in this world, and he was trading away his birthright. And here it says, it's interesting because he's called somebody who's sexually immoral. And the story is just about eating food. But the Bible here says, see that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance, writes as an oldest son. And then afterwards, it says here, when he sought for it diligently, when he went back and he cried, the Bible says, even with tears, he was crying. And he said, please, can you bless me? He went to his father, Isaac, can you bless me with some sort of blessing? He said, I've given all the blessings to, to your brother. And he pleaded and he cried. But the Bible says here, he could not find repentance. He could not change what was already done. And here Jesus is warning the church. He said, I'm giving you a chance to repent. But then he goes on to talk about the punishment. He's, and the punishment, he says, I will cast her into a bed. And she'll suffer there. He says, I will kill her children with death. This children can speak about the, the people that are following after Jezebel's way, speaking of her children, in one sense, her spiritual children that are following in her ways. And if we are to follow in that way, what does the Bible say here? It says, the, the punishment, I will kill her children with death. There is a way that leads to life, and that's through the straight and narrow way that Jesus offers to us. He offers us life and life in abundance. But then there's a way also that leads to death. And it's a sad thing. It's a promise of certain punishment that comes. You know, and sometimes we say, yeah, yeah, you know, but God knows my heart. And I say, yes, God knows our heart and he knows how desperately wicked it is. And that's why we need God's help. You know, sometimes we try to ease our conscience and we try to ease ourselves. Yeah, but you know, God knows my heart. He knows, you know, I fail. And I, yes, he does. But that's not an excuse not to repent. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, it says, For from within, out of a person's heart, 
God knows our heart, so he knows that from within you find all of these things. What is it? Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. But there's hope. Hallelujah. There's hope in Jesus. If we repent and turn to the Lord, that's the solution. Repent and turn to God. This church, they were headed in, a, in, in, in the wrong path. There was a lot of negative things that were going on. But there's hope if we repent. Right? There was, thank God, though, that there was, in this letter we read, there was a few, there was a group of people that did not follow the ways of Jezebel. And I think in, in, in many churches, we'd probably find this mixture where there are some people maybe that come and maybe they're just the, the nominal group. I say, I'm just here because, you know, it's Sunday and I should be in church, you know, and I'm singing because this is the right thing to do. But there's no relationship with God. There's no devotion. There's no love that's there. And it's, very, and it's a very difficult thing. But then there's probably another group which Jesus commends in this church for living a holy life. And he says, oh, this group of people, they have not got mixed in with this group of Jezebel and, and her followers. They haven't, uh, they haven't uh, mingled themselves with that, but they've continued to live a holy life. They haven't backslid and they haven't been affected by these things. And so he tells them to be faithful, to stand fast. In Hebrews 10, in verse 23 and 24, it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we should spur one another on towards love and good deeds. You know, they had a lot of good, good deeds. There was one thing at, near the beginning of the letter, Jesus was commending them for their good deeds and for their service and for their faith and love. And there were a few things there that they had, but Jesus just basically summarized that up in one line. And then went on with all these other things that they needed to correct. And I wonder how many of us in our lives, we need to re-examine our lives and reposition ourselves in the way of holiness. Maybe we need to re-examine our lives and reposition our lives in the way of God. In the way that leads to life. In the way that leads to eternal life. In 1 John chapter 2 just a couple more verses and I'll close here. First John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, it says, Do not love the world nor anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The world is in, and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Dear people of God, we're, we're, we're bombarded with the things of the world. We are bombarded with the standards of the world. We are bombarded with the mentality of the world. We are surrounded. We are living in this world, but Jesus does not want us to be of this world. He says, as we, as we read in, in the scripture, he says in Colossians, set your affection on things above. Set your affection on things that are above, not on the things of the earth. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And so it's very easy for us to compromise our convictions and compromise our standards. The things of God, it so easily goes by the wayside and we'll say, oh, no, maybe we'll do that tomorrow. Oh, no, that's not so important. And we take so many things of God so lightly. And sometimes we take the things of the world so lightly. And that causes us to compromise on our convictions. You know, the great uh, uh, writer John Bunyan, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He was, uh, Pilgrim's Progress is probably the second uh, most famous book in the world, second most published book in the world next to um, the Bible. And John Bunyan, he was thrown into prison because he was preaching the gospel. And it was in prison that he actually wrote Pilgrim's Progress. But he could have easily come out of prison if he promised, that he, if he promised the people that he would not preach the gospel. 
And basically what he told them, he said, if you release me today, tomorrow I shall preach. And so there is no hope for him to be out. And he spent many years there in prison, but it worked out for good because he wrote this beautiful book that becomes such a blessing to millions of people over so many hundreds of years. But he did not compromise his conviction or his standard. And he was not willing to change the word of God so that he could have a moment of liberty or a moment of relaxation or a moment of relief. And we don't need to look so far back in history. So many of our brothers and sisters around the world in China and in North Korea and in, 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 in the Middle East and in so many different countries are going through persecution and suffering. You can just turn on the television and you can, you can see so many of it that's happening in the world today because they want to stay faithful to the Lord. It's so easy. It would be so easy for them to say, well, you know, I don't need to, you know, say that I'm a Christian and let me just, you know, in my heart, I'll be a Christian. But outwardly, I'll just say this and that so I'm not killed or persecuted. And it would be so easy for them to do that. But they didn't. Finally, just closing this, this letter, he talks about the reward for those that repent, for those that stay faithful. He says, I will, uh, the overcomers, I will cause them to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Speaks of the authority that God will give us, you know, as we stay faithful to him. And the, the final reward is that he, he says he will give them the morning star. And this can, this, uh, some, some of the uh, Bible scholars say that this morning star is probably an allusion to, um, to something that was more literal in the church at that time. But again, as I mentioned from the beginning, there's not a lot of archaeological evidence and, and things that uh, we, they could dig up in order to give this letter a little bit more context of what was going on in the church at that time. But we read in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, here it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And so as a reward to this church, he says, I'm going to give you the morning star. In one sense, it's saying, if you overcome, your reward is Jesus. That's the best reward that we can get. I don't know about you, but there's no greater reward than winning Jesus. Paul the Apostle, he says that I might know him. He, he, he said, I'm running this race that I might win Christ, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. And Paul desired to know Christ, wanting to win Christ in all those things. So may the Lord help us. I know I've gone a little bit over time today, and I know it's probably not the most cheery message to, uh, to listen to, but how many know that we need to listen to the whole word of God? And, and I pray that we won't leave here just thinking, oh, yeah, that was an important, important message for me. But I pray that we would make decisions today to say, I'm going to change this thing in my life. I'm going to change this thing in my life. I need to reorientate myself. I have not been seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I have not been putting a priority on the word of God. I need to reorientate some things in my life. I need to reschedule my life as well. I need to do certain things so that the things of God get a priority over these other things. And I pray that God would help us in these days to make those difficult decisions. It will be sacrificial decisions to make. We might be losing out on certain things. We might be denying ourselves of certain things. It, it might be taking up our cross in order to follow Jesus. And there might be certain debts that we need to die to certain pleasures, to certain things that maybe are not pleasing to the Lord. Whatever it might be, each of us are in a different situation in our spiritual pilgrimage. But I pray that the word of God would help us to repent and turn to him because God is giving us an opportunity. He's caused us to study these letters so that we can see the good but also the bad in some of these churches and fix our lives, reorientate our lives for the glory of God. God bless you.